Welcome to another video. This is a walkthrough of the Edexcel Higher Tier Paper 3 exam from 2018. These are the official papers that were sat in 2018. You can see I've been procrastinating a little bit here, so let's get straight into the questions. Question 1 says the scattered diagram shows information about 12 girls. It shows the age of each girl and, and the best time she takes to run 100 meters. Okay, so here's the scatter diagram. Zoom out a little bit so we can see the whole thing. So here are the times and here are the ages. Okay. Part A says write down the type of correlation. So there are three types of correlation you need to know. There's positive, negative or no correlation. And it's based on the line of best fit. So a line of best fit is a line that you think represents the scatter diagram, represents the general trend of the scatter diagram. Here we can see there's kind of a trend like down this way. And if we were to draw a straight line to represent this data, it would kind of be like this, right? Uh, you want it sort of in the middle of as many points as possible. And this is a line with a negative gradient. So we call that negative correlation as the age increases, the times decrease. A positive correlation is a positive a line with a positive gradient and no correlation will have all of the points kind of randomly in different places or else it will be a horizontal line. Okay, so the answer here for part A is negative for one mark. Part B says Christina is 11 years old, her best time to run 100 meters is 12 seconds. The point representing this information would be an outlier on the scatter diagram, explain why. Okay, so let's have a look at the scatter, scatter diagram again. And Christina was 12 years old, sorry, 11 years old, and she ran 100 meters in 12 seconds. The people around 11 years old, they were running at over 16 seconds and about 14 and a half seconds. So she's run uh, 100 meters in 12 seconds. That's much faster than the others in her age group and way outside of this general trend of the data. So, or in other words, way outside of the other values we have. So that's why we call, call it an outlier. And the way we can describe that is to say it is outside the trend of the data. It is outside the trend of the data. Uh, it does not lie near the line of best fit. Okay, so that was part B. Part C says Debbie is 15 years old. Debbie says the sc scatter diagram shows I should take less than 12 seconds to run 100 meters. Comment on what Debbie says. Again, let's go back to the diagram. You can see here they've only measured people from about 10 years old to 14 years old. Debbie's 15. She is outside the range of this particular data set. Um, so we could possibly make, uh, you know, an estimate of what she should be getting. But this, this scatter diagram by itself does not show uh, Debbie as a 15 year old what time she should be getting. Uh, so what we generally say to answer these types of questions is uh, 15 years old is outside of the range of data, so she is incorrect. The other thing is just to note that while this looks fairly like a fairly uh, consistent trend between years 10 and 14, we don't know what it would look like outside of that range. Um, so we know this doesn't continue, of course, because if it continued indefinitely, we'd eventually get negative times 100 meters. That's obviously not the case. Eventually it does flatten out. Um, so it must be some kind of curve because there's only a limit to how fast somebody can run. Um, but uh, we don't know when that occurs. We would have to do more measuring to get more data for 15 year olds. Okay, so that was question one for a total of three marks. Question two says expand and simplify five bracket P plus three bracket take two bracket one take 2p bracket. So for these you want to expand out the brackets and then collect like terms. So expanding the first brackets we have 5p 
uh, plus 5 times positive 3 is plus 15. So we're multiplying that term outside the brackets with everything inside the brackets. Uh, then we have negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. And negative 2 times negative 2 2p, remember to include all of the signs with those terms, that's positive 4p. And then collecting like terms, 5p is like with 4p, so that would be 9p. And then 15 take 2 is 13. So final answer here, 9p plus 13 for two marks. Question 3 says here is a trapezium drawn on a centimeter grid. And down below it says on the grid draw a triangle equal to the area, equal in area to this trapezium. So let's find the area of this trapezium. I guess you could try to count up the squares, but why not go ahead and use the formula for the area of a trapezium which says this is the top plus the bottom multiplied by the height, the perpendicular height divided by two. That's how we find the area of a trapezium. So the top here is two. So uh, substituting these values into this formula, two plus uh, two, four, six, seven is the base multiplied by the height. The perpendicular height is one, two, three, four divided by 2. Uh, 4 divided by 2 is 2, so I'll write this as 2 times 2 plus 7 is 9, and that is 18. So I get an area for that trapezium of 18, and now I need to go ahead and draw a triangle with an area of 18. Uh, so how could you make a triangle with an area of 18? You could do a height of 2, and then a base of 18, or a height of 4 and a base of 9. I might go with that. So my height for the triangle is four. The base is nine, so two, four, six, eight, nine. Just fitting in there and then create a triangle. Okay, you could do it a bit fancy. You could draw it even something like this would be fine. It doesn't have to be a right triangle. As long as the height is 4, the base is 9, or something equivalent that gives you an area of 18, and you'll get the marks there. So, also, I guess uh, you could draw in the dimensions. So, this is 4, and the base is 9. Okay, so that was question 3 for two marks. Question 4 says When a bias six sided dice is thrown once, the probability that it will land on 4 is 0.65. The bias dice is thrown twice. Amir draws this probability tree diagram. The diagram is not correct. Okay, here we have the probability tree. And then down below it says write down two things that are wrong with the probability tree diagram. Okay, let's have a close look and see if we can spot anything wrong here. Looking at this first row, the first thing I notice is these probabilities do not add up to one. Remember when you have uh, the total set of possibilities, either the dice can land on a four or not land on a four, uh, those probabilities need to add up to one. They're all of the things that could happen. Um, so both of those things happening needs to be 100%. Uh, so 0.65 plus 0.25, that's only 90, uh, 0.9, so that's only 90%. Um, so either one of these is wrong. And if we look at the second throw, uh, it not landing on a four, is now 0.65. So before landing on a 4 was 0.65, now not landing on a 4 is 0.65. Either he's got a different dice here or he's written these numbers wrong. And in the question it says he, he rolls the same dice twice. The bias dice is thrown twice. So uh, these probabilities cannot switch over. So this is uh, another mistake. These should be the other way around. Um, so I think we've spotted the mistake here. This should be 0 0.35, not 0 0.25, and these should be the other way around. So let's go ahead and write these down below. Um, so we could say something like the probabilities, the probabilities for the first throw, first throw, do not add to one and we could even point out we noticed that it should be 0.35 not 0.25 there 
Okay, and then the second one we noticed was the the probabilities here were the wrong way around. So for the second throw, uh, we could say the probability of landing on four on second throw after rolling a four is wrong it should be 0.65 um, you could also I guess point out this one it saying this should be 0.35 or you could also say they should be the other way around however you like to state that uh, there are the two things wrong with that probability two diagram and that was question four for two marks Question five says ABC is a right angle triangle. Work out the size of angle ABC, give your answer correct to one decimal place. So we're looking for this angle in here. Let's call that theta. And this is a fairly straightforward trigonometry question. You just need to know which ratio to use. So remember the three trig ratios you learn in GCSEs are sine, cosine, and tan. And a way to remember the uh, what they represent in the right angle triangle is to remember this mnemonic so ka toa so ka toa this stands for opposite hypotenuse adjacent hypotenuse opposite over adjacent so let's go ahead and see what we have here we have the adjacent side to the angle and the hypotenuse that's cosine so c a h means cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse so we're going to use the cosine ratio to say that the cosine of theta, because I've called this angle theta, is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, that's seven over 11. And then theta, now you need to know how to find the inverse cosine. We write this, this as cosine of negative one of seven on 11. That's going to give us the angle. Then you need your calculator. So pull your calculator out and find the inverse cosine of seven on 11 and I get 50.478 and so on. So this equals 50.478 and some dots to showing that those decimals keep on going and we need to round this to one decimal place. So look at the second decimal place. Is it five or more? Yes, it is. So we round that four up to 50.5 and that is my final answer there for that angle, 50.5. Part B says the length of the side AB is reduced by one centimeter. The length of the side BC is still seven centimeters. Angle ACB is still 90 degrees. Will the value of cosine of ACB, ABC increase or decrease? You must give a reason for your answer. Let's go back to the diagram quickly. So AB is reduced by one centimeter. So uh, that 11 centimeter hypotenuse is now 10 centimeters. But BC remains at seven centimeters. That means this hypotenuse, uh, which would now be 10 centimeters, has to shift down a little bit. So uh, you imagine this side, if we shrink it, in order to create a triangle, if this stays as a right angle triangle, this needs to come across and then we get a new triangle. Okay, so that angle in there has now shrunk a little bit. Um, and the question asks, uh, Will the value of cosine ABC increase or decrease? Give a reason for your answer. Well, remember that the cosine of an angle is the ratio of the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. Now, for the previous one, we had a ratio of seven on 11, but now, uh, well, I didn't mean to put A there. I should have put theta or something. So now we have a slightly different angle. Let's just use a different symbol like alpha. Uh, this is, the ratio is seven on 10 because the hypotenuse is now 10 centimeters. Uh, well, the previous value of cosine ACB, ABC was seven on 11. Now we have seven on 10. Basically just asking which of these fractions is larger. Uh, seven on 10 is a larger fraction, right? Um, so we could say seven on 10 is larger than seven on 11. So uh, 
cosine of ABC has increased. I can see some people falling into the trap of saying, well, clearly the angle has decreased. So co the cosine must decrease. Uh, just remember that the cosine is the ratio of those two sides. If this side has, uh, has decreased, the cosine must increase because it's the ratio of those two things. Okay, so that was uh, part B and question five for three marks. Question six says there are some counters in a bag. The counters are red or white or blue or yellow. Bob is going to take at random a counter from the bag. The table shows each of the probabilities that the counter will be blue or will be yellow. There are 18 blue counters in the bag. The probability that the counter Bob takes will be red is twice the probability that the counter will be white. Work out the number of red counters in the bag. There are two pieces of information we need here that are not given in the question, but we can work out. The first one is the number of counters in the bag, the total number of counters. The other one is the probabilities of red and the probabilities of white. Uh, so we can use the information I've given us, such as there are 18 blue counters in the bag, and they've also given us the probability of picking a blue. This is based on this number, the number of blue counters and the total number, putting those two things together, we can work out the number of counters in the bag. Also, they tell us that the probability that we get a red counter is twice the probability that the counter will be white. And that's going to allow us to find these probabilities because all of these probabilities must add to one. So these ones, let's do some calculations, 0.45 plus 0.25 this equals 0.7, the remaining probabilities must equal 0.3, again, because they need to add up to one. So the probability of red plus the probability of white needs to equal 0.3. Also, red is twice the probability of white, um, so we could even introduce a variable, you don't have to, but I'm just going to say, let's say that white is x, then the probability of red must be 2x. So this is 0.3, uh, then 3x equals 0.3, so x equals 0.1. Doing it algebraically like this probably is not necessary, but uh, uh, maybe you can just see that if the probability of white is half the probability of red, it must be 0.1. However, now we can say the probability of white, of picking a white counter is 0.1, and then therefore the probability of a red counter is 0.2. Okay, uh, now let's go ahead and work out the total number of counters in the bag. As I said, using these two bits of information, we can say, well, how do we work out that probability? We do 18 on the number of counters. Uh, so we would do 18 divided by the number of counters, the total number of counters, and that would give us 0.45. In this case, we don't know the number of counters, so we can uh, do this in reverse and we can say the number of counters number of counters is equal to 18 divided by 0.45 so 18 divided by 0.45 I get 40 so the total number of counters is 40 and now we can also work out the number of red counters uh, because we know the probability of red. So let's go ahead and write these in. So I've got 0.2 and 0.1 for white. Doing a similar thing to work out the number of counters. To work out that probability for red of 0.2, we would do the number of red counters, number of red counters, over the total number of counters. Now we know that's 40, and this would be 0.2. So let's do this. Uh, let's do the inverse of this, the number of red counters, counters is 0.2 times 40. Uh, this is 20% of 40, or 40 divided by 10 times 2, however you want to think about that, you'll get 8. So the number of red counters, final answer is 8, and that was a 4 mark question. Part B says a marble is going to be taken at random from a box of marbles. The probability that the marble will be silver is 0.5. There must be an even number of marbles in the box. Explain why. For this, let's think about how we would work out this probability. Uh, we would do the number of silver marbles. Number of silver marbles. 
divided by the total number of marbles, uh, total number of marbles, and we are getting a probability of 0.5 or one half. Uh, if we swap these things around or did some algebra with this, we can multiply the left hand side by two, multiply the right hand side by the total number of marbles, whatever that is. Uh, so I'm going to introduce some variables here just so I don't have to write these sentences out again. So silver marbles could be S, so we would get two lots of the silver marbles equal to uh, the total number, let's just say total. So the total is two times the number of silver marbles. Two times anything, it must be an even number. Um, so there must be an even number of marbles in the box. Also, this is quite an algebraic way of thinking about it. You could just think about it logically and say, well, if, uh, if the probability of a certain number of things is 0.5, then the total number of things must be double that. Uh, so if we ever, whatever number you have, if you double it, you will have an even number. Um, so however you want to state that, uh, I think will be fine. Uh, let's just say something like doubling gives you an even number. So, so this is how I've summarized it. I've said the total number of marbles is double the silver marbles. Doubling or multiplying by two, any number will make an even number. And that was, part, uh, that was one mark for part B and five marks for question six. Question seven says solve five take x on two equal to two x take seven. All right, so we have an unknown on both sides. What we need to do is combine like terms, bring everything or bring the x's onto the left and have the numbers on the right and then we can solve for x. So the first thing I would do here is multiply the right hand side by two to get rid of this denominator. So on the left, I'll be left with five uh, take x equal to four x take 14 and then bring that 4x over to the left, or we could actually do it the other way. Uh, what I like to do is to end up with positive numbers. So rather, I would like to take this negative x and add it to the right-hand side. So this is going to be 5x equal to uh, 5 plus 14. Take that negative over to the left-hand side. So 5x equals 19, and then x is going to equal 19 on 5. Okay, so final answer there. Bit of a funny final answer, 19 on 5. And because it doesn't specify whether to leave it as a mixed fraction or an improper fraction or a decimal, you can answer it however you like. So you could change this into a mixed number, but 19 on 5 is perfectly fine for final answer there for three marks for question 7. On to question 8. Question 8 says A, B, C, D, E is a pentagon. Angle B, C, D equals 2 times angle A, B, C. So where are these? So B, C, D is in here, and that's two times angle A, B, C. Angle A, B, C is in here. So this one is two times this one. Uh, work out the size of angle B, C, D. You must show all your working. You'll notice in this pentagon, we are given three angles. Uh, so we're going to need to know the sum of angles in a polygon uh, for this one, uh, specifically the sum of angles in a pentagon. Now the formula is looking like this. So for angles, angles in a polygon, the sum of those angles, we can say this equals n take two multiplied by 180, where n is the number of sides. So for a pentagon, for a pentagon, this is going to be five take two times 180 because a pentagon has five sides. So then we're doing three times 180, three times 180 is 540. Uh, so now we want to create an equation with this diagram. So how could we do this? How could we create an equation uh, with one unknown to solve? Well, if we know that angle BCD is two times angle AB, ABC, if we call this theta, this angle we could call two theta because it's double this angle. Um, so now I can say all of these angles added up need to equal 540, and that's going to be one unknown of theta. Uh, so adding all of these up then, we get, we get three theta plus 115 plus 125 
and then this means 90 degrees, so plus 90 degrees, and this all needs to equal 540. So simplifying then, uh, I can't be bothered doing that in my head, so I'm going to go to the calculator just so I don't make any mistakes. 115 plus 125 plus 90, this equals 330. Uh, so we could say 3 theta plus 330 equals 540, and then you want to subtract that 330 from 540. So 3 theta is going to equal, the difference between these is 210, and then divide by 3 to get theta. So 21 divided by 3 is 7, so I know that 210 divided by 3 must be 70. Okay, so remember what the question was asking. The question said work out the size of angle BCD, and that was 2 times theta. Whoops. So angle BCD, angle BCD must be 140 degrees. So final answer, 140 degrees there for question 8, and that was 5 marks. On to question 9. Question 9 says T equals the square root of W on D cubed. W equals 5.6 times 10 to the negative 5. D equals 1.4 times 10 to the negative 4. Work out the value of T. Give your answer in standard form. Correct to three significant figures. For this, you could uh, substitute these values into this equation and then simplify a bit, or you could try to put it straight into your calculator. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. So if W is 5.6 times 10 to the negative 5, and d is 1.4 times 10 to the negative 4. We just need to substitute them in here and uh, round off our final answer. So putting this into the calculator then, uh, pretty much this is just a test of whether you can in input something into a calculator correctly. On your calculator, you should have a fraction button. So that makes the display look like a fraction. That's going to make it a lot easier here. For mine, I have to use a bunch of brackets. Uh, so as long as you're entering correctly, you should get the correct answer. Then on the bottom, I have 1.4 multiplied by 10 to the negative 4. And all of this is cubed. Um, so I need to put another set of brackets and then cube that. And then a bracket around the whole thing because it's all under the square root. And I get... 4517.53 so I might write that down firstly so I'll write down the operation I did I did 5 5.46 5.6 sorry 5.6 times 10 to the negative 5 over 1.4 times 10 to the negative 4 all cubed and I got 4,517.53 and so on. And I need to write this in standard form correct to three significant figures. Well, we could round it off first. This would be 4,520 to three significant figures. Remember, look at the fourth sig significant figure. If it's five or more, we need to round the next significant figure up. So we add one to it, so we get 4,520. And then if we write this in standard form, uh, we need to bring the decimal place that's at the end of the number, one, two, three places in. So this is going to be 4.52 times 10 to the three, or 4.52 4 times 1,000. And that's my final answer there, 4.52 times 10 to the power of three for two marks. Part B says W is increased by 10%, D is d increased by 5%. Lottie says the value of T will increase both because both W and D are increased. Lottie is wrong, explain why. I'm going to write out the original equation again. So this was T equal to W on D cubed. Now if we increase uh, W by 10%, one way we could write this is 1.1 W. So that's 1.1 multiplied by the original amount. Uh, that's how we could increase something by 10%. So we could write this as the square root, or let's say T1 representing the new value of T. This could be written as 1.1 W. And then if we increase something by one uh, by 5%, we could write this as 
D. So that's the new D. And we would have to cube that whole thing. Uh, so this would be 1.05 D all cubed. Okay. Now this is equal to, if we simplify this a little bit, this would be 1.1 W over 1.05 cubed. Let's figure out what that is. So 1.05 cubed is 1.15. I'm going to round that, that off to 1.16. So this would be 1.16 roughly. And I need to use approximation signs there. 1.16 D cubed. And now let's simplify further. Uh, so we could do 1.1 on 1.6 and get uh, a figure for that. So 1.1 on 1.16. This is 0.94. I could even round off to 1.95. I think this will still show either an increase or decrease. So this would be the square root of uh, 0.95. I think I was saying 1.95. So just 0.95 W on D cubed. And uh, we could even simplify further and say this is equal to the square root of 0.95. Let's get an answer for that. So the square root of our previous calculation, this is 0.97. So 0.97, if I separate that square root of 0.95 out, uh, that would be 0.97 multiplied by the square root of W on D3. And remember, this is our original value of t. This is what we had, and it's multiplied by 0.97. So we could write this then as a 0.97 t, our original t, in there. So we just swapped uh, t, or we substituted t in for uh, square root of w on d cubed. Then we can say that the next value of t, the one we called t sub 1, is 0.97 times the original t. Uh, remember, Lottie said the value of t will increase because both w and d increase. Well, we can see it actually decreased by something like 3%. Um, so just to finish off there, we could say t will decrease, decrease uh, by more than two percent okay so a fair bit of work there for that two mark question but that was question nine for four marks question 10 says here are three lamps lamp a lamp b and lamp c lamp a flashes every 20 seconds lamp b flashes every 45 seconds and lamp c flashes every 120 seconds the three lamps start flashing at the same time how many times in one hour will the three lamps flash at the same time anytime you see a question like this uh, you know, things leaving at different intervals, it's pretty much always a lowest common multiple question. So you want to find the lowest common multiple of these numbers because that's when they are going to catch up with one another, if you like, and flash again at the same time. Uh, so we're looking for the lowest common multiple of 20, 45, and 120. There is, I believe, a function on your calculator that will actually calculate this for you. Uh, but I think it's good practice to go ahead and do it with prime factors as well. Uh, so you can write each of these numbers as a product of prime factors. So 20 you could write as 4 times 5 or 2 squared times 5. 45 is 9 times 5 or 3 squared times 5. And 120, uh, well 120 is a little bit harder. We could start off with 2 times 60 and then 60 is 12 times 5 and then 12 is 2 squared times 3. So all of the prime factors put together there, that's two cubed times three times five. Okay, so we've uh, pr factorized each number into its prime factors. And now the lowest common multiple is the prime factors with the highest powers. So you notice we have a two squared in 20 and a two cubed in 120. We take the two cubed because it has the highest power. Then the 3, we have a 3 squared, so that belongs in the lowest common multiple. And then uh, the 5, the, the only 5s that we have are to the power of 1. So 5 to the power of 1 in the lowest common multiple as well. So that's how we are working out the lowest common multiple. Uh, and then we just need to multiply these numbers together. 2 cubed is 8, 3 squared is 9, and 
this is multiplied by 5 this is like 72 times 5 again why not just go to the calculator rather than wasting my brain power because this is a calculator paper after all this is 360 so the lowest common multiple here is 360 um, and then let's go back to the question this was in seconds so they flash together every 360 seconds. How many times in one hour will the three lamps flash at the same time? Well, let's convert this to minutes. 360, divide that by 60, that's six minutes. Uh, so there are 10 lots of six minutes in an hour. Uh, so I would say uh, this is 10 times per hour. So my final answer then, therefore, question 10 is 10. Question 11 says, in 2003, Jerry bought a house. In 2007, Jerry sold the house to Mia. He made a profit of 20%. In 2012, Mia sold the house for £162,000. She made a loss of 10%. Work out how much Jerry paid for the house in 2003. So Mia bought the house for some price and then she sold it for £162 and that was a loss of 10%. This 10% is based on the original amount. Um, so another way we could say this is she bought the house for a certain price X and then we reduce that by 10%. So reducing something by 10% we can multiply it by 0.9 and now it equals 162,000. To find X we can divide by 0.9 so the price she bought the house for is 162,000 162,000 divided by 0.9 this is 180,000 and then we know the price that Jerry sold the house uh, so he sold the house for 180,000 pounds and he made a profit of 20% so let's say his price that he bought the house was x1 increase that by 20% or multiply by 1.2 that gives us the price he sold the house for of 180,000 and so then his original price that he bought the house for is 180,000 divided by 1.2 so 180,000 divided by 1.2 that's 150,000 that's meant to be a 5 not a 6 so 150,000. Um, so Jerry bought the house for 150,000 pounds for a final answer there. On to question 12. Question 12 says the graph shows the volume of liquid L liters in a container at time T seconds. Okay, so here we can clearly see the volume is increasing over time. And part A says find the gradient of the graph to find the gradient, we can look at the rise over the run and pick two points on intersections of the grid line. So I would start at 0, 04 and then look at 410. And that's going to give me a clear rise over run. So the gradient is equal to the rise over the run. Rise is 6, 4 to 10. The run is four zero to four so six on four which we can simplify to three on two so final answer there for the gradient three on two or one and a half part b says explain what this gradient represents we could describe this as a rate so it's the rate that the uh, the liquid pours into the container so it's the rate that it's increasing in volume over time uh, so the rate that that the liquid pours into the container. Uh, E.g. this would be 1.5 liters per second. Part C says the graph intersects the volume axis at L equals 4. Explain what this intercept represents. Uh, so this is saying at time equals 0 seconds, the liters in the container is uh, four liters. So uh, remember it says the graph shows the volume of liquid in a container at time second time t seconds. 
we don't know what the start of the time represents. We don't know what is actually going on. We don't know much context. All we know is that the start of the time at, at time zero seconds, the, the volume in the container is four liters. Um, but we don't, again, we don't know what that time represents. So I would just say something like to start with at time zero seconds, there are four liters of liquid in the container. And that was question 12 for four marks, just interpreting a straight line graph there, I guess. On to question 13. Question 13 says, here are two similar solid shapes. Surface area of shape A equals the surf, uh, sorry, the surface area of shape A to the surface area of shape B is three to four, that's the ratio. The volume of shape B is 10 centimeters cubed. Work out the volume of shape A. Give your answer correct to three significant figures. For this question, you need to know the relationship between the different dimensions of similar solid shapes. There is a, a relationship between the surface areas and the heights and the volumes. Uh, so we can say the ratio of the heights, so the height of A to the height of B, that's meant to be a B there, is equal to the square root of the surface areas and this is equal to the cube root of the volumes. Also, we can get a direct relationship between the ratios of the surface areas and the volumes. If we cube both of these, we get the ratio of the volumes is equal to the cube of the square root of the surface areas. Uh, of the ratio of the surface areas. Um, so we have that ratio. We have the ratio of the surface area of A to the surface area of B. So then we can say the, vo the ratio of the volumes is equal to this. Now we know the volume of shape B as well. So we could say the volume of A on 10, which is the volume of B, this is equal to the cube of the square root of uh, three on four, uh, all cubed. And it's important you make sure if you've got the volume of A on top, in the numerator, you also have the surface area of A in the numerator. So you make sure those ratios are correctly uh, related to each other in the equation. Then we just need to go ahead and solve this for the volume of A. So what I'm going to do is multiply this side by 10. So the volume of A is equal to uh, the square root of three on four, all cubed, multiplied by 10. And then I'm going to whack that straight into my calculator. Uh, so I have the square root of three on four, and that is all cubed. And I'm multiplying that by 10, and I get 6.495, and I needed to round that to three significant figures. So I'm going to write 6.495 down, 6.495. Uh, actually, I'm not rounding that off yet. So write three dots to say that keeps on going. And then to three significant figures, look at the fourth significant figure, that's a five. So that means I need to round the next one up. That becomes a 10. So actually I need to round the second significant figure up as well. So to three significant figures, this is going to be 6.50. You could also think of that as adding one to 49. So this is 6.50. Final answer then for the volume of A, 6.5 centimeters cubed. Actually, I also need to include that zero because it said three significant figures. So make sure you include that zero as well. That was question 13 for three marks. Question 14 says there are 16 hockey teams in a league. Each team played two matches against each, each of the other teams. Work out the total number of matches played. The way that I thought about this problem was that if there are 16 teams, uh, how many other teams are there for you to play against? So let's say you're one of those 16 teams. Uh, let's just call your team Team A or something. How many other teams are there to play against? Well, there are 15 other teams. So you're going to get uh, 15 games against those other teams. 
Uh, but each team played two matches against each of the other teams, so you're going to get 15 times two matches uh, per season, right? So if your team A, you are getting 15 times two, you're getting 30 matches per season. And that's true for every team. Every team is getting 30 matches per season. Uh, so how many games in total are we getting? We're getting 16 teams, 16 teams, multiplied by the 30 matches that each team plays. However, remember that if your team A, team A, and you're playing team B, when you take the perspective of team B, they're playing you. So we're kind of double counting. If we're just doing 16 times 30, we're saying we're counting the game of team A versus team B. We're also counting the game of team B versus team A, but they're the same game. So what we need to do with this number is also divide it by two to get our final uh, number of total number of matches played. So in order to not double count uh, team A playing team B and team B pl playing team A as two separate matches, we need to divide by two. So this, the way I thought about it is uh, 30 games per season for each of the 16 teams, but we divide that by two, so we're not double counting anything. And if you work this out or put this into a calculator, 16 times 30 divided by two, I get 240. So final answer, total number of matches played, 240. There are a number of different ways of thinking about these types of questions. Uh, I'm not going to go through any others, but just be aware you may have a different method and that's perfectly fine. Okay, on to question 15. Question 15 says the graph shows the speed of a car in meters per second during the first 20 seconds of a journey. Okay. Uh, part A says work out an estimate for the distance that the car traveled in the first 20 seconds. Use four strips of equal width. Uh, this involves finding the area under this graph. Uh, that's how we get the distance from a speed time graph because after all what is distance it's speed multiplied by time and if we multiply these two things together we get an area under the graph uh, so it also says use four strips of equal width so that's giving you a clue that you need to split this up into four shapes and because it's 20 seconds it's going to be every five seconds okay and for each shape, use the shape that you think best approximates it. Uh, for the first one here, we're going to use a triangle because we're starting at zero, zero. For the next one, well, we don't really know how to find the area under that curved place, but if we draw a straight line between these two, then we have a trapezium. We know how to find the area of a trapezium and the same for the other two. So what this question is really asking for is to find the area of these three trapeziums or trapezia plus this triangle. So let's go ahead and see if we can do that. Let's call this shape number one, number two, number three, and number four. So the area of one, area of shape one, this is a triangle, this is the base times the height. Okay, so now we actually need these values of where we're getting to this graph. This scale is going up by one, so this would be 22 on the y-axis or the speed axis. This one would be 28, this one would be 32, and this one would be 45. Okay, so base times height divided by two, this is like five times 11, that's 55. So that's my first area. My second area, this is a trapezium. This is the base plus the height. Now in this case, remember, this is like a sideways trapezium. This is the top, this is the bottom. So 22 plus 28 uh, divided, uh, multiplied by the height. The height is five divided by two. We talked about that formula earlier in the paper. And then let's go ahead and work this out. This is like, uh, what could we say? This is like 50 times five divided by two, uh, half of 50 is 25, so this is like 25 times five, this is 125. Area three, the 
top is 28, the bottom is 32. So this is 28 plus 32 multiplied by 5 divided by 2. 28 plus 32 is 60 divided by 2 is 30. So this is 30 times 5. This is 150. And then the final area, area 4, the top of the shape or the trapezium is 32. The bottom is 45. So we've got 32 plus 45 multiplied by the height divided by 2. Uh, I don't see any way to simplify this. 45 plus 32 is 67. So 67 times 5 on 2. I'm going to use the calculator for that one. 67 times 5 divided by 2. I get 167.5. Okay, so then my total area is all of these things added up. Again, with the calculator, 55 plus 125 plus 150 plus 167.5, I get 497.5. Uh, going back to the question, it said work out an estimate for the distance. This is my estimate for the distance for the first 20 seconds. So 497.5 meters for three marks. Part B says, is your answer to part A an underestimate or an overestimate of the actual distance the car traveled in the first 20 seconds? Give a reason for your answer. Uh, going up to the graph, let's have a look. You can clearly see this is going to be an underestimate because each of these shapes is below the graph. So this triangle here, it leaves a little gap. This one leaves a little gap. The last one doesn't have much of a gap, but even so, the other ones have gaps, so it must be an underestimate. This is not over. This is not an overestimate here, so I would just say this is going to be an underestimate as areas are less than uh, actual area under the graph, under the curve or graph, either way. Okay, that was part B for one mark and question 15 for four marks. Question 16 says the nth term of a sequence is given by a n squared plus b n where a and b are integers. The second term of the sequence is negative two. The fourth term of the sequence is 12. Find the sixth term of the sequence. This is pretty much a simultaneous equations question. Uh, so we can say that a uh, times two squared because remember when it's saying the nth term is a n squared plus b n. n represents the, the whatever term it is. So if it's the second term, n is going to be 2. So we can substitute 2 into this expression here, a n squared plus b n, and this is going to equal negative 2. So uh, a multiplied by 2 squared plus b times 2 is equal to negative 2. So just to simplify a little bit, this will be 4a plus 2b equals negative 2. And then also substituting 4 in, we would get 16a, 4 squared is 16, uh, plus 4b equal to 12. And now we have two sets of equations. We could call this one equation 1 and this one equation 2. And what I want to do is to solve for a and b and then find my sixth term. In order to solve these, I might use elimination. So if I multiplied equation 1 by 2, uh, then I can subtract them, and then I will have eliminated b. So I'm going to do equation 1 times 2, take equation 2. So this will look like uh, multiplying equation 1, the whole thing by 2, I get 8a plus 4b equal to negative 4, and then subtract equation 2. 16a plus 4b equal to 12. If I subtract these things, uh, you see that the 4b take 4b, they are going to cancel each other out. So 8a take 16a, this is negative 8a. 4b take 4b, they disappear. And then negative 4 take 12, that's negative uh, 16. And then I have negative 8a equal to negative 16. If I divide by negative 8, I get a equal to 2. And then substituting that into either of these equations, let's pick equation 1. 
I get 4 times 2 plus 2b equal to negative 2. This is 8 plus 2b equal to negative 2. So 2b is equal to negative 2 take 8, which is negative 10. And then b is equal to negative 5. Uh, so now I have a and b. Then I can look at this expression again. I can say that a n squared plus b n, I could write that as 2 n squared plus, uh, sorry, take 5n because b is negative 5. So now I have 2n squared take 5n. If uh, n equals 6, let's see what we get. We get 2 times 6 squared take 5 times 6. This is equal to 6 squared is 36 times 2 is 72. Take 30. This is 42. Uh, so my final answer after all of that, the sixth term of the sequence is 42 for four marks. Uh, the second part, part B says here are the first five terms of a different quadratic sequence. Find an expression in terms of n for the nth term of this sequence. To find the nth term of a quadratic sequence, what you want is the second difference. Um, so the second difference is uh, looking at the First difference, that's the difference between each term. So the difference between 0 and 2 is 2. The difference between 2 and 6 is 4. The difference between 6 and 12 is 6. And so on. This is 8. Then the second difference is the difference between these numbers. So 2 to 4 is 2. 4 to 6 is 2. And 6 to 8 is 2. This is what we call the second difference. If you think of a quadratic expression, we write this as ax squared plus bx plus c. To find those a, b, and c, a is equal to half of the second difference, and c is equal to the zeroth term. I'll talk about what that means in a minute. And then you can find b once you've found a and c. Because we have this second difference, we can say a is half of this, 2 is the second difference, so a is equal to 1, 2 divided by 2. Then c is the zeroth term. This means if we go this way one more time, so to the left of the first term. So if we were to go back a place, well, the difference is still 2. The second difference is still 2. So we take 2 from 2, that gives me 0. So the difference here then is 0. So my zeroth term is also 0. Then another thing I can say is that a plus b plus c is equal to the first term, right? Because if x is 1, that gives me a plus b plus c. So because a is 1, c is 0, a plus b is equal to 0. That was my first term. So b is equal to negative 1. So finally, I have all of the terms in my quadratic expression. I can say that the nth term is equal to x squared take x. Uh, so, or if we were writing n, sorry, I should use n because we're talking about the nth term. So this is n squared take n. And there are other ways of finding the, the nth term of a quadratic sequence as well. That's just one method you could use. So that is part B for two marks and question 16 for six marks. Question 17 gives us a diagram that says work out the length of AD, give your answer correct to three significant figures. So AD is here and we're given all of these things. So DC is 12.5 centimeters, this angle is 34 degrees and so on. Okay, so how can we find AD? Something I noticed is that I could find this length if I had another length in, in this triangle. So if I knew this length in here, I could use one of my rules to find AD. So go ahead and think about what rule you think I could use there. If I've got two lengths and an angle, which rule do I use? That's right, it's the cosine rule. Um, so is there a way for me to find BD using this triangle, the information in this triangle? Um, Actually, that's one of my other rules. Which rule do you think I'm going to use here? I've got two angles and a side. So which rule do I use? It's the sine rule. So when you've got two angles and a side, you can use the sine rule to find the other side. So we can say that DB on uh, the sine of 34, the angle opposite to that side, 
the ratio of these things is equal to uh, the ratio of this side, 12.5, on the sine of its opposite angle, so the sine of 109. This is what we call the sine rule. Um, and then I can use this equation to find dB. So dB is equal to 12.5 on sine of 109 multiplied by the sine of 34. So let's go ahead and use our calculators for that. Um, so I have 12.5 divided by the sine of 109 multiplied by the sine of 34 and I get 7.3926 and so on. So I might leave that as, uh, or I might write down quite a number of those decimals so I can get a, a fairly accurate final answer. Okay, so I get uh, 7.3926747 and so on. And now I have a value for dB. As I said, when you have two sides in an angle, you can use the cosine rule to find the other side. Uh, so the cosine rule says a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared. Take 2bc cosine of a, the angle between those two sides. So I could say that a d squared, a d squared is equal to uh, either one of these can be b. So I could say 11.4 squared plus uh, 7.39 and so on squared those dots just mean there are more decimals that I could include there this is take 2 times b 11.4 times c 7.39 multiplied by cosine of 86 the angle between those two things so let's go ahead and plug that into a calculator so I've got 11.4 squared plus the previous answer squared. Use that answer key on your calculator where you can to save a bit of time. Subtract two times 11.4 multiplied by 7.39, uh, sorry, the previous answer. The previous answer uh, multiplied by the cosine of 86. And I get 172.8 five and so on so that was a d squared uh, but I want the square root of that so I can take the square root of that answer and I get 13.147 and so on but I need that to three significant figures so if I round that off to three significant figures look at the fourth significant figure uh, that's less than 5, so that's going to stay as 13.1. So final answer there for question 17, 13.1 centimetres for 5 marks. Question 18a says, show that the equation x cubed plus x equals 7 has a solution between 1 and 2. Now the first thing you can do here is to write this equation as x cubed plus x take 7 equals 0, and then plug 1 in. So we could say when x equals 1, we get 1 plus 1 takes 7. This is 2 takes 7, this is negative 5. And then when x equals 2, we get 2 cubed, which is 8 plus 2 takes 7. This is 10 takes 7, this is 3. So what's happened here is if we look at this expression, this one here, we're looking for a solution when it equals 0. Uh, at x equals 1, it's negative 5. At x equals 2, it's 3. So uh, if you think about this graphically, for example, uh, you could draw a graph of this expression here. And you might have something like, you might have something like this. And the solution is represented by where the graph cuts the x-axis and down here is where we got the negative 5 down here somewhere up here is the 3 the positive 3 this is 1 this is 2 uh, so we can see then that solution must be between 1 and 2 because at some point it's past the 0 it's gone from negative 5 zoom past the 0 and gone to 3 so the answer must be between those somewhere um, so that's how we're doing this 
we plug one in to this, we plug two in, and then we say, well, there must be a solution because uh, the signs change. We had a negative here, we had a positive here, uh, so there must be a solution. Uh, so to finish this off, we say, as uh, the signs change, uh, when we say signs, we mean the negative or positive sign. As the signs change, there must be a solution between 1 and 2. Okay, that was part A. Part B says show that the equation x squared plus x, x cubed plus x equals 7 can be rearranged to give x equals the cube root of 7 take x. Okay, here you just need to know your rules of algebra, so you could subtract that x from the left, right hand side, so x cubed equals 7 take x, and then take the cube root, x equals the cube root of 7 take x. Um, so that's all you really need for that one mark there. And then we need to go ahead and do some iterating. Part C says so starting with x sub 0 equals 2, use the iteration formula x sub n plus 1 equals the cube root of 7 take n x sub n three times to find the estimate for the solution of x cubed plus x equals 7. Right, so x sub 0 equals 2. What this means is that x sub 1, the next estimate of the solution, is going to be the cube root of 7 take 2, because x sub 0 is 2. That's what x sub n is in there. We just take that number, plug it in, and we get the cube root of 7 take 2, or the cube root of 5. And uh, we need to write that decimal down. So let's take the cube root of 5 and get a decimal. That's 1.7099 and so on. Uh, so this is roughly 1.709. Okay, uh, actually, if you put the three dots, you don't need to write the estimation symbols. So 1.709 and so on. So x sub 2 is going to be the cube root of this number, take our previous answer, so 1.709, sorry, 7 take our previous answer, uh, and actually what we can do here is we can uh, put this in again, so we'll do 7 take our previous answer, and enter, that gives me another answer, and then we could use our entry key again, and rather than having to type it out, it does it for us. So that's going to use our previous answer, input it into that formula, and do it all for us. So there's my next two iterations done already. So that was 1.742, 1.742, and x sub 3, uh, because it said use it three times. So x sub 3 is the cube root of 7 take this 1.742 and this was equal to 1.7388 uh, so it says find an estimate for the solution to this so I've done it three times this is my estimate here my final number that I end up with and it doesn't say what to round off to so I'm just going to write all of these down uh, 1.73884956 and that's my answer for part C and that was question 18 for 6 marks. On to question 19. Question 19 says here are two right angle triangles. Given that tan of E equals tan of F, find the value of X you must show all your working. Okay, so you need to remember what the tangent of an angle is. That's the opposite over the adjacent. Uh, so the tan of E, we could write as x over 4x take 1. And the tan of F, we could write as 6x plus 5 over 12x plus 31. Okay, so we know that tan of E equals tan of F, therefore these two things are equal. Hiding under this question is really uh, just an algebraic fractions question. So... Uh, all we're left with here is this equation that we need to go ahead and simplify and solve for x. Because we have one unknown, we know we're going to be able to solve for that. So let's see what we can do with this equation. And the first thing I would do is to multiply 
by the denominators, so we don't have fractions anymore. So on the left, I would have x times 12x plus 31. And then on the right, I have 6x plus 5 multiplied by 4x take 1. And then expand out, so I have 12x squared plus 31x and uh, 24x squared using FOIL. First out is in as last, multiply these out. Negative 6x plus 20x take 5. Simplify further. Um, so, well, if we combine like terms, so subtract that 24x from the left, I get negative 12x squared. Then over here I have negative 6x plus 20x, that's uh, 14x, and then 31 take 14x, the difference there is 17, positive 17x, and then that 5 is the only constant, so adding that to the left hand side I get plus 5 equal to 0. When I have a negative coefficient of the x squared term, I like to divide through by a negative 1. Uh, because I prefer this number to be positive. Again, you don't have to do this, but uh, it's just a personal preference. So dividing through by negative 1, I get 12x squared take 17x take 5 equal to 0. And then I'm going to try to factorize this. So can you think of factors of 5 and 12 that make 17? Well, if I factorize 12 into 3 and 4, the only factors of 5 are 5 and 1. If I multiply the 4 by the 5, that gives me 20. And 3 times 1 is 3. 20 or negative 20 plus 3 is negative 17. So I'm going to be able to factorize this into 3x and 4x. Uh, the 3 needs to be multiplied by 1. The 4 needs to be multiplied by 5. And that needs to be a negative 5 and a positive 1 to make negative 17. This equals 0, therefore x equals 5 on 3, or x equals negative a quarter. Uh, if you are not sure how I'm solving this quadratic equation, check out my video on quadratic equations. I go through this in detail, why I can say x equals 5 on 3, and so on. Um, so anyways, these are my solutions now for x. And let's go back to the question. Remember, x is a length because... Uh, they tell us these are two right angle triangles. So x is a length, therefore it cannot be this negative solution. So uh, let's say as x must be a positive length, x equals 5 on 3, not negative 1 quarter. So final answer there, just to answer the question, find the value of x, x is equal to 5 on 3. That was question 19 for five marks. Question 20 says 50 people were asked if they speak French or German or Spanish. Of these people, 31 speak French, 2 speak French, German and Spanish, 4 speak French and Spanish but not German, 7 speak German and Spanish, 8 do not speak any of the languages. All 10 people who speak German speak at least one other language. Two of the 50 people are chosen at random. Work out the probability that they both only speak Spanish. For this, I'm going to draw a Venn diagram. You don't have to. Sometimes it can really help to kind of visualize a problem rather than just working with all of the numbers. Uh, so here's my Venn diagram, and I'm going to need three sets because we have the three languages. Okay, that's not a rectangle, but that's fine. I have three circles, and they all need to overlap because some people are speaking... Uh, all three languages, so I'm going to have a set or a union in the middle of these three. And here's my final circle. And the three languages were French, German, and Spanish. So this could be French over here, this could be German, and this could be Spanish. Okay, so using this Venn diagram, let's see if we can interpret this information. So 31 people speak French. So in total, there's 31 people in this set. Um, so I'm just going to make that in red because eventually I'll rub that out. That's just a little note to myself. Uh, two speak French, German, and Spanish. So in here, the union of all three things, there's a two. Okay. Four speak, four speak French and Spanish, but not German. 
so French and Spanish, but not German, is this area in here. That's the union of French and Spanish without any German. Uh, seven speak German and Spanish. Okay, and that doesn't say but not French. So in total, we need seven people in this area. Let me just highlight that to make it clear what I'm talking about. We need seven people in this area, right? Because they did not say, we did, they didn't add this bit on the end. They didn't say, but not French. So seven people in this orange area. Uh, that means that five people are in here. German, Spanish, but not French. Eight do not speak any of the languages. In a Venn diagram, that goes in the corner. So if it's not in any of the sets, we just draw it out there. All 10 people who speak German speak at least one other language. Okay, so that means in this area of just German, there's nobody, there's a, a zero. Uh, generally in Venn diagrams, we don't write zeros, so that's just going to be blank. So if there are 10 people that speak German, that means there's a three in here of German and French, but not Spanish. So now this 31 comes in useful because we know there must be in total 31 people in this set speaking French. In here, I have three plus two plus four, that's nine. So in the just French area, uh, that's going to be 31 take nine. 31 take nine is 22. Okay, so there's 22 people that speak French but no other languages. And remember in total, we have 50 people. So if there's 50 people in total in here, remember eight people didn't speak any of them. That leaves me with 42 in the inside the sets so far I have 31 plus 5 that's 36 so remaining I have six people that only speak Spanish and no other languages um, so the calculation I did there was 50 take 8 because there were eight people that didn't speak any languages so 42 people had to be inside the sets then I did uh, the 31 people in French plus the five that spec that spoke German and Spanish. So I did 31 plus five. Uh, actually, I did. Actually, I did 42 take that. So I did 42 take 36, which was six, and that gave me that number there. Okay, so I've completed my Venn diagram now, and I need uh, the probability that two of the people. Uh, only speak Spanish um, so that is that number so the probability of only speaking Spanish is 6 out of 50 for the first person and if I choose another person well I've removed one person from this set so there'll be five people in that in that area to choose from and then 49 people in total because I've removed one person. Um, so you need to consider the probability for each person because they say two people are chosen at random. You pick one out, you pick the other one out. You'll get two separate probabilities. Um, so then I have 60 on, six on 50 times five on 49. You could do some canceling here. Uh, so you could divide that five by 50. This would be one on 10. And then you could simplify this fraction. Six on 10 is the same as three on five, multiplied by one on 49. And then I get three on uh, five times 50 is 250, take five is 245. So my final answer is three on 245. But again, it doesn't say give your answer in simplest form or anything. So even a decimal there would be fine for a final answer. Anyway, that's just question 20 for a total of five marks. Just a quick look at the Venn diagram there again. Okay, on to the final question. Question 21 gives us a diagram and it says ABCD is a parallelogram. ABP and QDC are straight lines. Angle ADP equals angle CBQ equals 90 degrees. Prove that triangle ADP is congruent to triangle CBQ. Okay, so ABP, ABP, that's that straight line. Uh, QDC is this straight line. ADP is this 90 degree angle in here, QBC is this one in here, and ADP is this triangle, this one, and 
QBC, sorry, CBQ is this one. Okay, so we need to show that congruent. Uh, the first thing I will start with is that AD equals BC, and that is a rule of parallelograms. Remember, they tell us that ABCD is a parallelogram. So I can say that AD equals BC, and these are opposite sides of a parallelogram. Okay, so those two lengths are equal. We can also say that BCD, this angle in here, BCD is equal to DAB. That's another rule of parallelograms is that opposite angles are equal. Okay, so that's my next uh, that's my next observation, BCD equals angle DAB, and they are opposite angles of a parallelogram. Let's look at these triangles again. I have the 90 degree angle clearly equal, they're both 90, a side that's equal and another angle that's equal, and this is actually a rule of congruence. If I have angle, side, angle in that order that are equal, then I can say the triangles are congruent. Um, so that's all I actually needed there. Uh, AD equals BC and angle BCD equals DAB. Therefore, triangle ADP equals triangle CBQ due to the ASA rule of congruence, angle side angle rule. Okay, that was part A. Part B says explain my AQ is parallel to PC. So AQ and PC, where are they? AQ is here, PC is here. Well, looking at these two triangles uh, that we found were congruent, ADP and CBQ, because those two triangles are congruent, therefore we can say AP equals QC. Uh, so AP, the line AP, is the same length as QC uh, because uh, those two triangles were congruent, so that was due to the congruence of the triangles. Because those two lines are equal in length, AQ and PC must be parallel. Uh, you know, you, ca you cannot have the same lengths there and have those not parallel, right? Because these two lines are given as parallel. Uh, so we can say just because these two are the same, AQ and PC must be must be parallel. That's all we really needed to recognize there. That was for two marks for part B and question 21 for five marks. And that is the end of the paper. I hope you found that useful. Please leave a like if you did. Subscribe if you want to see more content. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.